Today, um, I kind of want to kick it off. Uh, I asked uh, three customers to join. Uh, we have Matt Roper from Cherokee. We have our friend Russ Leatherman, and we have uh, Mohit. I'm not sure if he's here yet uh, from um, uh, uh, Informatics. Um, so if you don't mind, maybe uh, you guys just to do a quick intro of who you are, and then we'll go from there. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, I'm Matt Roper. We're for Cherokee County School District. I help manage the network and virtual infrastructure. So that's anywhere, anything from uh, firewalls, load balancers, uh, core routers, and of course, all the uh, uh, Azure Stack HCI clusters we have, which is actually three right now. So, Awesome. Uh, Russ, are you there? Yeah, I sure am. So my name is Russ Leatherman. I'm one of the systems engineers with Snohomish County IT in Washington State, about 40 minutes north of Seattle. Um, we have a Microsoft shop up and running. We do HCI and we do a lot of uh, deep repository stuff using data on gear. There's basically six systems engineers and four network engineers and then we support maybe 3,200 people across perhaps 28 departments and some other local entities. Thank you, Russ. Well, he, are you there? All right. So, and Daryl, uh, you're 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 one of the guests today. I, 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 we we say we had to be inclusive of all our customers, especially in Europe. So I asked you to join since you're based in Netherlands. And, and can you tell uh, the audience here who you are? A little bit of background. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if I'm a customer. So I I did a few implementations of data on hardware in in Europe, uh, together with uh, with the uh, European Partner Access. Uh, personally, I'm a Microsoft MVP uh, focused on cloud and data center management. Been a lot of years on the Hyper-V side of things, adopted Storage Space Direct early, so uh, glad I did. Um, so yeah, that's what, what I do. So I do, uh, I work as the brain, I do consulting and help customers to uh, onboard cloud. Is it me or is it he's coming in kind of hard? It sounds fine to me. Good. Awesome. Oh. And we always have John. We have to always say, okay. Uh, we also have John. We always have to make, make sure John speaks because he's always the our anchor here. John, who are you? For pe those people that doesn't know you. I'm John Marlin. I'm uh, with Microsoft. I'm a part of the... Uh, Azure Stack uh, HCI team. I actually own the failover cluster features, storage replica, and uh, disaster recovery. Thanks, John, for continuing to be here to uh, answer the tough questions. I, pro I, I really appreciate it. Um, okay, Matt, let's start with you. Uh, if you don't mind sharing about kind of a high level we have and, and maybe share with the team, some of your or what you want to share like you know challenges learning that that people could kind of uh, learn from yeah sure howard uh so you know we have uh, three clusters here like i mentioned earlier um recently implemented one this summer specifically for our video uh, video cameras so um we got to the point where a lot of our camera systems were failing in our uh, schools so we decided to instead of using that distributed NVR based approach uh, we decided to centralize that and so we bought some uh, cameras and a uh, software partner that actually can support some centralized storage. So that was really good success story there. Uh, that's the most recent one we've done. Uh, just a simple two node cluster, uh, 206, uh, 276 terabyte. Um, it's just running a single VM at their primary data center here, but uh, we have a uh, secondary uh, VM that runs in uh, our secondary DC, uh, which is a five node cluster. Um, run about 45 VMs there. And then our primary data center, uh, six nodes, I run about 90 virtual machines here. Uh, so we have a pretty decent size footprint. Um, we do perform backups between the two uh, using DPM today, uh, and that works well for our use case. Uh, of course, we'd like to change that in the future at some point, um, but right now that works really well. And, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge that we ran into Howard and uh, and thankfully we solved it now, but was uh, around, uh, you know, some of the documentation from uh, 
uh, Mellanox specifically <laughs> was saying to do one thing uh, specifically to block uh, or turn off a spanning tree, uh, which <laughs> that caused a loop in the network. So um, it was a bad time for about an hour there, but after we figured that out, uh, we got it working. And then two, we had tried to integrate those Mellanox switches with the Alcatel switches that we have today, or actually at the time we had Alcatel, now we have Fortinet. Um, but just differences in, in the implementations of uh, spanning tree between those two, the incompatibilities was a bit of a challenge there. Um, otherwise, though, yeah, you bring up you, you bring up a good point, Matt. Actually, yeah. and 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 to believe or not, network continued to be a interesting and uh, very very um, important topic every time we discuss customer because. Getting a network correct is so important to Azure Stack ACI because everything is filtered through the RDMA fabric. If Daryl, from your implementation experience, how do you address the networking aspect to make sure ahead of time that your customer doesn't run into those issues? Well, first of all, I always do a design session at Forend, so before the implementation. And at some customers, we have like a greenfield, right? So they just say, oh, we only do storage traffic over the switches that come with the solution, for example. So that's easy for us, right? But if we're like Matt, have to integrate with other switches that they are already running, like I had one case with a Cisco switch, which was a little bit different than I used to. So then it's actually going to documentation of that specific vendor to see you know, the specific terms like VPC and all that kind of stuff to see, what, to see how it integrates with each other. So it, it, it's customer, it depends on the customer actually to, to see what they have already on site and how to mix and match that. If you go in converge, Got right? So if, but if you have dedicated storage Got switches, it. which is my preferred solution, then it's pretty straightforward and you can just follow the guides from from data on Mellanox. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Hey, Russ, um, Chala, can you share with the team about a little bit about your environment and, and, and kind of your uh, your current setup? Yeah, absolutely. So we were an early adopter back in 2012 of data on JBODs. Uh, we actually ran those for quite a while. We had a, a scale out file server that was uh, feeding our um, Hyper-V implementation that was replaced by uh, HCI solution. Initially, we built four nodes. We added four more nodes for a total of eight nodes. Um, we have a couple of Keplers out in the wild. We have uh, several repositories that we run Veeam on to do all of our backups. And we're still running a couple of your cluster in a box setups, the 9470s. Wow. <laughs> still running too. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, those have been very solid. Got it. Okay, thanks. Hey, Mohi, thanks for joining the games. Uh, uh, maybe you could do a quick intro who you are and, and what your business is about. Sure. So we are an MSP uh, out of Louisiana, and uh, we were always curious about the solution and uh, ended up implementing two uh, clusters. One is a four node, one is a two node. And uh, the four node is a pretty heavily, I would say pretty heavily, uh, uh, stacked. It runs about 140 VMs um, and also is running about 260 terabytes of usable storage right now and um, at 768 gigs of RAM in each node. So that was an interesting experience to implement it. Um, I think also we I think we were one of the first people to try the Mellanox 100 gigabit uh, backbone. So, so effectively two NICs simultaneously working at 200 gigabits per second. I don't know if it's very useful, but we did it. Uh, it's a tiered approach with NVMEs and hard drives. Uh, so almost 50-50 ratio there to kind of see how that performance would be taken care of by NVMEs. And then this, we have a lot of clients who are engineering uh, uh, providers and therefore the, so a lot of good files just never get touched once they're done. So the hard drives could have been fine for those. Um, like what I heard, we had some issues early on with Mellanox, especially I think with because, and we were always uh, curious just because we were the first 100 gigabit is causing issues of what was happening there. Um, 
but whether it was spanning tree and we did a, again networking can go in any direction we ended up doing and i'm always curious that if we have a hyperconverged solution why not implement it as a hyperconverged and pass all the traffic through the same NICs, especially we had that kind of bandwidth but then we started doing going in that direction but then separated just the vm traffic through the 210 gigs out outwards but the backend traffic was all through so even that was a different implementation um we had issues called microsoft support and it was surprising because you heard that roke is very hard don't do this uh you know go iwarp and like we've already invested into the solution and it's working so there, there was also this conflicting almost for some time we felt like were we on the right track in terms of networking? You know, is uh, Silk Valley not the right path or not? Because we were getting uh, double, uh, two kind of uh, recommendations there. So that was one experience. The second thing we realized was when we were going to do something. And by the way, we started with 240 terabytes. We have doubled that. So at this point, and that's a different story. We'll probably touch later on. We are at 500 terabytes on the same equipment, uh, 500 plus terabytes now. So second thing was how to back back this up how do you implement a good backup solution and uh, we tried uh, different vendors but ultimately went with Veeam and that was it um, we learned a few lessons there too in terms of how to optimize the backup how to optimize the communications and interestingly enough uh, still have we don't think we have 100 percent perfect solution there but uh, but that was a and we are doing replication offside and we're also doing backup with Veeam's so that was an interesting experience too, especially having a hyperconverged network on the back. Got it. Yeah, John, this this topic, I know that's not your uh, expertise, but the, the, the topic of networking continue to be a very, very good discussion among every time for our customers. From, from what you've seen, have, have this particular topic subsided with all the implementations or is continue to be a very, good discussion in your world of Microsoft. Mr. Marlon, I think you're muted. Yeah, give me one second. Mr. Marlon, I think you're muted. Yeah, give me one second. All right, that was fun. John is having network issues, but I was so okay. curious if I could yeah. break in. Yeah. If Maurice could elaborate a little bit on his biggest lessons that he learned from the Veeam implementation, because I see a lot of customers using Veeam and they're very happy about it. But what is what is the biggest lesson in combination with an HEI solution? Mm. On the subject of networking, like you, like you had mentioned, Howard, I don't get a lot into it. Uh, we generally leave that to up to the customer and the vendors and so forth to uh, do. However, with uh, announcements that we'll be making here in a couple of weeks at it, at MS, Inspi MS Inspire, another shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> we are announcing we are announcing something new, and we are going to have some at least best practices or, or guidances around networking when talking about Azure Stack HCI based off of those things. So we, I will be getting a little more into networking. I hate networking personally. I've always hated it, but now I'm forced to get into it. So okay, good, 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 good to know that you continue to make changes. Hey, Daryl, yes, you had a question. Sorry, Daryl, you had a question. Can you maybe uh, ask the question again for Mohit? Yeah, so I was curious about his lessons that he, he learned from the implementation of Veeam on the HCI solution. So what were the biggest hurdles that he uh, sure. overcame? Uh, so first was, you know, um, again, if you are doing a pure, uh, so let's say we had Mellanox switches and they were, uh, um, you know, and it, till, till the traffic is moving between Mellanox, it was not as bad. We were still seeing a lot of pocket packet paused, um, uh, having a lot of pauses going on there. And then second was, since if you're running a management, uh, the management network for the clusters, your backup traffic moves on that, that VLAN. 
Therefore, we had to bring the traffic out of the Mellanox environment for a remote site, and which means connecting those Mellanox to other switches and you know, pushing your VLANs out to other switches. Now, naturally, um, I mean, 100 gig switches were not cheap. Uh, so we were pushing to 10 gig brocade switches, and we realized that even between having two different network equipment, when you do a DBC, data center, or DCB, data center bridging, those had issues. Uh, we still didn't, don't quite understand the flow control, that you know whether flow control should be enabled, should be disabled, even from data on perspective. We had first scripts where we disabled them, then we found some, you know, blog entries and uh, talking about you no know, flow control should be enabled. So there were these issues that you know are those switch dependent, are those NIC dependent? But there's confusion about that part too. So those were um, some issues which continued. Second was you know we were not achieving uh, when we would run Veeam backups, we would see the source is the. Uh, bottleneck and source was supposed to be the 100 gig network with the NVMe drives and we were like if source is a bottleneck between running on the you know super micro servers which are all running high drives they were performing faster and we were like this shouldn't be the case where you know we got these clusters with NVMe and they are all even to the date continue to be the source as a bottleneck so that also brings a question to storage that you know that the Though their data is kind of dispersed across different hard drives, and we have plenty of you know, 2020 hard drives, I think, per node now. Even then, we continue to see that. Uh, um, so the, it put doubts in our mind whether it was the networking that was causing the bottlenecks, whether it was the drives causing the bottlenecks, because you know I can understand that uh, IOs per per uh, drives are limited. But the whole idea of storage dispersing that and the data coming across multiple drives should make up for that, especially if a RAID card on a, a destination server is performing faster. So these questions are still actually a question mark that why are we um, achieving uh, these kind of discrepancies between source and destination when we do perform backups? Um, same thing was with replication. We set up RAID 10 clusters to do a replication, but replication couldn't catch up. We would never be able to do continuous replication in vain, and we have to stack or stagger it and say, okay, we will do only replication every few hours. And so there were these questions, which in theory, I think S2D was supposed to provide provide a great performances, but we don't see that part still yet. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I how deep I can go, Howard, but please stop me if I go too deep. But you could, uh, you could go as deep as you want because all these are geeks people on the call here. Don't worry about right. it. I see everyone laughing, so that's, that makes sense. Um, so you say you have 100 gig, so it's Mellanox ConnectX5, right? So you have Mellanox 100 gig, you have an NVMe cluster. Is that full NVMe or are the cast drives NVMe? So there is, it's it's 50-50. So 50% 50, 50 drives are NVMe, 50% are hard drives, 7200 RPM. So, but the NVMe's are set as cache journaling, right? As cache too, that's correct. Okay. And so let me elaborate a little bit on my experience. So mostly when I enable full NVMe clusters, the bottleneck is the CPU, right? Because in an hyperconverged solution, every everything in the system wants something from the CPU. And we're glad that we have RDMA, so that we do a little bit offloading to the NIC. Um, but still, all the I.O. that's going to the NVMe's or to hard drives, uh, still the, the physical process needs to touch it, right, to actually put the I.O. somewhere. So I mainly see that the CPU is the, is the blocker or the, the thing that's full where we push a lot of data. So I'm curious, but because Veeam is doing a good job with um, change block tracking, it shouldn't be that much data that's coming from your cluster. And also, um, since you have caching, uh, the recent data is must be in your cache, cache layer, right? Because it's hot, it's hot data, so it must be in your cache layer. So that's it's interesting to hear that your, your backup is performing slower than your target, actually. Uh, so you got, a, you got four nodes, did I hear that correctly? That's correct. Well, that's interesting. So, the only reason a cluster would be slow if it's the the under the connection in between the nodes is slow, right? 
So the latency is high, actually. Slow is the wrong word. The latency is high. Um, and especially for reads, because backup is, is a read job, uh, it doesn't make much sense to me. So well, I, I cannot say, I cannot pinpoint it right now, right? But uh, I would definitely definitely look at the networking from this from to the server and in between. But if you're <laughs> so if you're saying that your destination server is faster than your N NVMe cluster with cache, then it's probably not the CPU that's the bottleneck, but something else, right? So it could be like you're doing DDoP or compression. Uh, we having a, a, a wrong ratio, but no, you have cache devices. So, but you have a wrong ratio for NVMe, HCD, all the kind of basic stuff. But since you bought a data on solution, I suspect that's not the case. So, uh, I, I think there's there's a lot a lot more to it, uh, Daryl. But uh, I think uh, we'll take this offline. Uh, but uh, I know that Mohi is really into. That's why I, I like talking to him because he's really into the design and his, he, he wants to optimize everything. Even right. though it took him like two weeks to uh, repair our hard drive, which is kind of bothering. He, he mentioned that last time with Jeff Jeff as well. But uh, it, it is just something that, that we continue to learn from customer Mohi that there are just areas that we continue to, to focus on in our design, in, in my opinion. It's a, it's a design discussion. It, it's funny that I think Mohi, you were the first one that actually had a tweet here with high endurance cache, NVMe, NVMe, then hard drive. I think you have that design, which is no one but, uh, uh, no, everybody has a satire in the middle. I think that includes uh, Matt Roper. So you actually have an NVMe in the middle, which is very interesting. But let me, let me pass it to uh, Russ real quick. Russ, um, uh, we just actually uh, posted uh, the Sohomish County um, use case on our website. Thank you for your help. And John, one of these days when you could travel, you should definitely go up to uh, Sohomish. It's only an hour and a half from you. Might be closer to you. I don't know where you, how close you are to them, but uh, it's a huge um, commitment to Microsoft that uh, Sohomish has done. Uh, they're essentially a, a pure Microsoft shop. Everything's Microsoft, and I, I think it's something that it's worth for us to continue to look at, at Microsoft down your, in your backyard. So, so Russ, from your perspective, what are some of the interesting challenges you want to share with all the customer here that you have experienced from your perspective? Well, I would say that as an early adopter of hyperconvergence, we encountered a lot of um, vacuums in the knowledge that was available to us. We found that you guys had the most knowledge and often when we turned to other support solutions, it seems like we were out ahead of the curve, and they tended to want to redirect us back to IWARP, like I heard earlier. And they also wanted to question um, uh, the networking that lies underneath everything, right? And I agree with what was said. I mean, until your networking is right, it's really hard to say whether your solution is performing well. Yeah. I know you guys struggled a little bit with Cisco connection in the beginning, right? Remember how we went through that entire thing with connecting your four node to Cisco, yeah. remember? Yeah, right, because our network team did not want to support another brand of switches. Yeah. Is, 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 is there a like a documentation out there connecting to Cisco switches as core that's very good? Because it, it comes up every 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 time with our customers. It's crazy. Yeah, I would have to talk to our our, um, our, our architect, our architect, uh, yeah. Ernan. He knows it really well, and I'd have yeah. to talk with him to see if he feels the documentation is up to snuff. Um, you know, it leads to a lot of discussions and whiteboard time <laughs> when we're trying to get around <laughs> these things. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah, um, and I think... Again, I don't want to drill down the network topic anymore. I'm sure Microsoft will come back with some direction, but every single customer sitting here today experienced network. Uh, I, I cannot underemphasize that. Uh, getting a network correct, taking the time, connecting to the, the course, which has been something that data on continue to get better at. And when we first started, I think I think the biggest thing was, was Benjamin. I can't believe we sat there for like four days talking about networking and getting that correct. Uh, but networking is 
the key here. So, so, so all the customer that's new, definitely have a lot of discussion, planning on network before you do anything because getting those VM to, to uh, talk and, and go with the north and south traffic flowing is very, very critical. Do you agree, Matt? <laughs> Yes, definitely. In fact, Howard, you know, one of the things that took us so long to figure out at the time was the the high availability, uh, you know, so we wanted to implement LACP right away off the bat. That way, if we had a, a switch go down, we could continue to pass the VM traffic through. So that was critical to us. And, you know, most of the time we get 80 gigs, but in the event of a failure, we can still, you know, pick up on that secondary link on that second switch and, uh, and deliver the uh, experience to the end user. So, yeah, that was critical to us. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, if anybody have a question, feel free to jump in. I, I'm going to continue down asking questions for these uh, uh, customer. But here's your chance to have a lot of people that has a lot of experience um, uh, on, on topics here. Um, I guess one one of the questions I always uh, ask the customer is that as you guys are the owner of your infrastructure, what are the best practices that you employed? <laughs> Uh, not every customer are, are the same, right? You guys have a own system practices, upgrades, patches, and everything else. What do you feel is your best practices to maintain your Azure Stack ACI cluster? Uh, maybe we start with uh, a mat a little bit. Uh, do it as little as possible. Because, uh, <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it like that, but I mean, ultimately, when you have the uh, three-tier architecture that we have, where we have NVMe, SSD, and uh, you know the spinning rust. It's just so much capacity there that the storage jobs take forever to rebuild. So that is a is a pretty big pain point for us. And in fact, I was just talking about that the other day. So it takes me pretty much the entire weekend to patch one cluster because it takes so long for those storage jobs to complete. Um, so that's a really big challenge for us ultimately. Um, that, it hurts because we'd love to be able to do cluster hardware updating. It's just not really stable enough to rely on it, at, at least in my opinion today. Um, and you know, it's just for somebody that's not me, somebody else on my team that has to come in, maybe update those servers. You know, if they don't know to wait on the storage jobs to complete before they start patching the next server and rebooting nodes, that could be a really bad day for us. You know, like bad days actually. You know, because the VMs just behave really strangely if you reboot them at the wrong time. So uh, I think one time we had somebody patch them. They didn't know what they were doing. And I think we had about eight hours worth of outage while those storage jobs were just going nuts. Uh, the performance on every VM was just just garbage. Um, I wish I had a better, more eloquent word for that, but it was really bad. Um, but yeah, that's that's the biggest challenge, Howard, and it's always been the biggest pain point for us is, is updates specifically and how they work today. I know there's promises of a better future, um, but today it's really painful. Well, he, you never experienced that, right? Yeah, we, did. <laughs> we never experienced that. No, we did a few times. So I think I have a few points there. I don't know if this can be a feedback. One is the Windows shutdown should be switched, should not be allowed if the cluster service is running. You know a node so there needs to be some kind of check there that if some this is running and it finds out um because i will tell you we uh, you know and they don't had set up evaluation softwares and we forgot to switch one of the change one of the keys on one of the system and that server uh, while a storage job was running or we were doing the shutdown on one server decided to because the license had expired or this evaluation period had expired just shut down at the same time so, you know, so we learned that our list and so if I always tell people that if you are, if you have make sure evaluation softwares are shut in, are taken out of the evaluation mode as soon as possible because when the license will expire, those machines will shut down. So that's one. So I completely agree with Matt that, you know, that's a storage jobs as long as they do. I mean, our engineers are asking the question that why did we move away from SANS? Because if we cannot because you know, the recommendation came from there on too was, well, it's going to take this long. It's better to have a shutdown period, pass the entire cluster and bring it back up. And, you know, we didn't used to have this. We replaced the uh, EMC and a Dell compellent system uh, with these things. And we never had to go into that. We have a shutdown entire system to patch a server earlier. So now we're in a mode, since storage jobs take so long, it's better to have maintenance windows and shut down the entire environment. And that's a big deal for us. 
So I think that part has been a little painful for us too. Second thing I learned as experience was stay with the standards. Um, we tried, I think we were the one of the first clients to say, let's move to Windows 2019 when it came. And some drivers were not ready and all the stuff. So this is a, you know, your lifeline. This, a lot of stuff depends on these things. So you want to make sure you're not the first one to try a new operating system. Uh, you're, not the, you know, you're not the first one to try 100 gig cards. And because then you don't know which one is the problem. Is it that this? So again, stand, staying with the standards is very important. We, we realize and let, so bleeding edge is not good here. And lastly, I realized, especially when you introduce backup systems and Veeam and all the stuff, talking to their engineers was, how many virtual disks do you want on a hyperconversion environment? And you have these relationships are between Veeam and S2D, how it works, that if you have only, for example, in four nodes, we have four virtual disks. So at any given time, the number of Veeam jobs that can run simultaneously gets reduced. It's only four jobs they want to run. So had we spread out those virtual disks more, we could run eight jobs simultaneously. So it's not really a hyperconverged problem, but you have to know that your orchestration and your backups will be done by Veeam. So what is the optimum level of setting up your hyperconverged environment to partner with other software that you'll be working with? So those were some lessons for us. Hey, Daryl, Daryl, this, the, these, these are real, this is a pain point we hear every single day from our customer and it hasn't changed. As a, as someone that's best practice, how do you recommend to customer regarding these, these store jobs, all that? What is your take on that? Uh, actually, I just, uh, we just created a, a webinar and it's called automatically update your SD clusters, but it's in Dutch, so I cannot recommend it to you guys, but, um, I mean, there are two things, right? So the, the length of the storage jobs, which take forever, but also the impact on the virtual machines that are running. And then we have the story, and I know John is in the call, so he hears the feedback loud and clear, that cluster we're updating is not always uh, running well, or I, I think it was two or three months ago where update decided to automatically reboot and cluster we're updating was not aware of that reboot and then stuff broke. So I think uh, John pushed uh, a form on Twitter saying, why don't you, why don't you use cluster web updating? And I think uh, a lot of people hesitate of using cluster web updating actually. So they're still updating it manually. I see a lot of customers updating manually. Um, uh, but I also see that virtual machine manager is, is great in updating the clusters as well. So they, it, it does the same as cluster web updating, but, but then managed from virtual machine manager and the, <laughs> The funny thing is that virtual machine manager is a little bit slower, so it didn't have the issue that cluster we're updating had. So, um, but still, the, the pain is there. So the pain of the rebuilding jobs is there. But luckily, uh, in new version of Windows Server or something, um, it will be a lot, a lot less because of uh, enhancements they made in the rebuild system, right? The repair system. So it's it's, it's the pain is there. Um, there are some scripts from a fellow MVP called Ben Thomas that puts the whole node in storage maintenance mode, uh, which for some people help and some people with multiple tiers, it doesn't help. So it's a little bit figuring out how your environment works and what does what works the best for you. So I have one customer who shut, actually shuts down his whole cluster. Uh, so he's, he's fast with the, with the update cycle but still his VMs are down, right? Um, and if you're lucky, you can have multiple clusters so you can move VMs around if you have enough spare space, right? So you can do a shared nothing live migration or cluster to cluster migration and then uh, have one cluster completely shut down with no VMs on it. So that's some strategies I see, uh, but to be honest, uh, it should be better, the repair. Hey, Russ, I know that for sure, Sohomish, you guys do a pretty good job on, you guys have a good size team, a good job of doing patches and updates. How, how do you guys get around with these challenges that people face on slowness and takes the time to do all that? How, how, do you guys have a best practice? So we patch manually. We've had very little luck trying to automate it or use uh, AstroWare updates. The I think the 
the problem we face is that it takes days to patch an eight node cluster without impacting your clients. And it seems like we can never get all eight of them to go without any issues and we wind up battling some unexpected um, you know, outcome before we can start moving forward again. I think that in retrospect, I wish we had put more SSD in front of our HDD and we have no use for the capacity that we actually wound up designing into our system. We just, we don't, we don't have a way to use it all. <laughs> so it, it kind of exacerbates the things we're talking about, right? Uh, more disks, more capacity, longer times to rebuild after reboots. But we definitely see people, you know, uh, we have a couple guys who primarily do the work for us and they spend days on it each month. Got it. Hey, John, what, what's your thought there? Okay. There's several things here. Uh, first off, the uh, storage jobs took a little while. Taking a while. At Ignite last year, we, had, we did announce that we are updating that to make it much faster. Unfortunately, that's all I can say. But in two weeks, we can talk about it more. So keep that thought in the back of your mind. Cluster um, we're updating. Uh, one of the PMs up here, Rob Heinemann, is the one who owns that. He's fully aware, well aware of the issues with it and is working hard with the dev teams to, to get it updated. Uh, because we're going to be using it a lot in the future. Again. Uh, what else was there? Uh, there was so to summarize, oh. to summarize in two weeks that everything will be solved. Is that what you're saying? I won't say it will be solved. <laughs> I'll just say two in a few weeks. Um, <laughs> the other thing about the uh, the shutdown, that is something that we are we are really looking into, um, based off of you know don't shut down or at least prompt if you see a storage job that's running. So we have heard that. Uh, we've also actually seen some issues when multiple nodes end up getting rebooted, uh, where you lose quorum of disks. So storage pool storage uh, spaces will go down or go offline because of, because of that. Uh, it is something that we are seriously uh, looking at and trying to get implemented. I've seen some steps on it so it is being worked on so i i have seen um marcus Zinovich give a demo i think it was two years ago about updating a hyper v server without rebooting it have you any thoughts on that john do you can share anything on that um one of the one of the things about cluster we're updating uh, one of the new things is uh, it's now going to check to see previously when you when you ran in ran cluster where update if it installed anything it's going to reboot period end of story now uh, it actually goes and looks to see if a reboot is actually required by a by a fix if it doesn't it, it doesn't now i think what you're talking about daryl uh, is called a kernel soft reboot and it's something that Azure does where basically when you install a patch it does it, it restarts the kernel but it doesn't restart the machine and that's something that we are looking at implementing uh, with Azure Stack HCI as well <laughs> and that will also prevent a lot of these storage problems. Nice. Good. Got it. So we touch network, we touch patching, touching uh, uh, customer update. These are all challenges. That's what I want to talk about. Um, what other challenges are we experiencing that we like to discuss? Uh, 
Uh, replacing so, drives. Okay, go ahead, please. I was going to say, I'm kind of curious, the folks that have had problems with cluster-aware updating, is that all on Windows Server 2016 or 2019 or both? Because so far it's been pretty good for me. That's <laughs> why I'm wondering if I'm, you're all making me nervous now. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll talk about 2019. We did 2019. It was not a problem, but it takes long. And that's what we realized was that if you do, you know, you put one node in one maintenance mode and you know, eight hours later, that'll be done. And then the second. So it's by the time you're done, it's a three day window um, before whole cluster is updated. And it just felt like if you're going to not spend three days on it, you, you can do it quicker by shutting down the cluster for in a few minutes. Just keep in mind that doing a, a maintenance mode, even though that, that's probably the safest way to handle things for, for some folks that have been burned in the past, but by putting a node and all its disks into maintenance mode, you are effectively forcing a rebalance of the entire storage pool. Um, so that's going to dramatically increase your, your maintenance window. So, I mean, if you're running a stable environment, you can kind of bypass that entire step um it, it's but yeah if you have a big storage pool you're gonna have a you're gonna have a very very long rebuild time kind of no matter what and it's going to be exasperated by your, your backing media too so again it depends on depends on if you like myself have been burned in the past i tend to i tend to put things in maintenance mode just to cover my butt but um it, yeah i think everyone's mileage may be different so wait, is that Ernie the bug finder of Microsoft talking? You find the no. most bug ever in Microsoft. I don't so find the bug. bug. The bugs find me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to record on how many bugs you submitted to Microsoft. That's real. No, it's more along the lines of how many, how many, uh, how many Xantax these these guys have taken from the Ajita I've given them over the years from finding stuff. But um, yeah, I've had I've had I've had quite a few problems myself, which is why I tend to be very cautious and, you know, like like I've been saying in the chat, when when those new features announced at Ignite go live, I will be a very happy camper. I'll just say that. Got it. Um, okay, so uh, so we touched on a lot of sensitive topics that all of our customers we, we see all the time. Um, any uh, happy news here? Uh, how's, how, how's the performance? Is, is, it, is people running okay? <laughs> Maybe you could share some happy news. Is, it, is because for, for you, Mahi, you know, you're 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 not just serving your business. You're serving a lot of business because you're MSP, and there's a lot of MSP out there moving towards a. I would say a, a more software-defined, cost-effective solution. Have you have you ever have a move you made, which you came from a traditional SAM, which is stable, and I, and I have nothing against fiber channel SAM because I came from that world. Uh, are you making a good move, and, and what are you, what are some of the good things you've seen out of it? Sure, absolutely. No, that's not all bad news. So, good news, <laughs> I'll tell you. We had, uh, I would say, an incident and an accident. I told you we had one node under maintenance down, second node environment of uh, the license shutting down us and then third accidentally triggering off so talk about a four node cluster and three nodes go down and i almost had a heart attack i said okay we're gonna lose data we'll have to go to backup but the, I mean, I have to, you know, acknowledge this as basically not acknowledge actually commend people who build the system that we shut down four nodes we brought them back um it repaired itself it took some time but everything came back up and, you know, whatever the magic was. And, you know, so that's the, the beauty of the system, too, that out of four nodes, somehow three went down. And then a few days later, the storage jobs had ended and we had no events coming in. So so it has done that wonderful thing, too. Second is, I will tell you, in terms of latency, um, this thing kicks butt. Uh, we haven't had the performance with EMC. We haven't had the performance with Compellent. In terms of how well is caching, how well is uh, the latency is so less. I mean, we felt the difference immediately when we implemented it in terms of same VMs running much faster. So there is absolutely, I mean, we are sold on that aspect of it that, you know, there is a 
We love the performances and responsiveness on the VMs. Uh, so that has been a very, very interesting, a very a good experience in that sense. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that because it feels like everything I talk to you, there's some negativity to it, which I love. That's why I want you to talk more because I want people to say nothing's rosy, but I'm, I'm glad that there is some good positive thing to it too as well. <laughs> Keep pushing the buttons, you know, I mean, if they, Microsoft <laughs> can go to 400 terabytes, we will, I mean, 400 uh, terabytes, we will take it to 400 terabytes. So are we one of those, if, if you say it can run on 100 gig gigabit switches, we will put 100 gigabit switches on the back, right? So our thing is, okay, if you're making claims, let's see, let's put it to test. But the problem is that MSP, we're trying to, you know, uh, do things in a, in a budget. So we're saying, okay, how many more VMs, how much more load can we put and squeeze maximum out of it, the specs allow it. And therefore sometimes it's a, it's an interesting dynamic there. Got it. How about you, Matt? Yeah, I mean, like, uh... Well, he said it, it's not all bad, right? I mean, we've had power failures in the data center uh, to where like half the nodes go down at the exact same time or all the nodes have gone down at the exact same time. And when you boot them back up, everything's clean. You know, of course, some storage jobs have to run, but other than that, everything's stable. So there's a lot to be said about that too. I mean, that's not always common, um, especially when you talk about where we came from, because uh, we came from, uh, you know, three different types of SANs with three different versions of Java that you had to use to provision storage and, uh, you know, local storage on uh, Dell R720. So we're actually using local physical 10K disks for VMs. So, I mean, there's a lot to be said positive about the solution. I mean, it gives you a, as close as possible to a single pane of glass to manage stuff. And of course, it's much, much more affordable for education. Uh, specifically and really anybody that invests in it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really good things to be said. You know, we we had a, a struggle at the time with our HR and payroll system that was cloud hosted by the uh, vendor and we moved it on-prem again and there was a night and day improvement. You know, people could actually feel that. Uh, throw, throw our apps out the window, throw a CPU out the window. You know, the thing that matters at the end of the day is your end user experience. If they can feel a difference, that's actually what matters. It doesn't matter how many IOPS there are. So for us, it was, you know, they could get their jobs done more effectively because, you know, queries and things that they'd run that would take minutes uh, to run would be down to seconds on the, uh, the on-prem cluster. So there's a lot of positives to say about it too. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, you guys are all the owner of your infrastructure and you guys have to suffer through the pain or everything, but ultimately it's the user that's going to be pushing you on their experience, right? It's always the, the, the for you, the teacher, the student who's accessing the data that matters. And, and if they're happy about the responsiveness of the infrastructure, then I guess that, that makes your day. That, that that's, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> One interesting concept, uh, I, I talked about this earlier, is, is workload and VDI was a topic last time we talked. How, how, given the challenge right now today, Matt, in your school, I assume that remote learning is something that you guys do? And how do you, how is that tied to your system infrastructure? Yeah, right now um, we're issuing uh, Chromebooks out to all of our students. Um, just it's a low cost way to deliver because um, a lot of our applications are either web based or um, uh, cloud cloud based uh, web based like in, in terms of we host the infrastructure uh, or you know uh, software or as a service through a, through a vendor so uh, typically uh, uh, web browser is all they need and so standing up a VDI solution really wouldn't be practical for us in that sense um, because we've kind of shifted the workload uh, we don't re rely as heavily on on like an on-prem device as, like we used to uh, used to a lot of the software that the students used was a installation on the computer. Um, so that would be delivered through a configuration manager. Uh, now that's kind of not the case, not not true anymore. So in, in, in your in your in your recent deployment, you say you use a two node ACI with a two tier NVMe hard drive with video camera. How is that? How is that going? Because there's a lot of customer here today and and also coming to to Microsoft looking at using Microsoft for a scale out storage, not really running a lot of VM, but but really storage, just capacity storage, right? How, how do you, how, how has that experience been? 
Uh, really good, actually. Um, you know, we we chose a solution that really was you know, that's the most important thing was to be able to centralize it um, and not have those you know school based NVRs because um, those are really a challenge to manage. In fact, a lot of them were running on uh, uh, Windows Server 2003. Um, so getting off of those this summer uh, helped from a security standpoint as well. But yeah, just from a performance perspective, it's it's really uh, nice and flexible because we can stand up uh, that primary cluster here at our data center. Most of the time, the video is uh, written back to that particular uh, cluster. Um, and thankfully, we do have some pretty good bandwidth between sites, 10 gigs specifically. Um, but in the event that for whatever reason that cluster fails, we have the secondary cluster houred up at the uh, secondary data center that we have. And what happens is those cameras will record there if in the event that the primary VM's down. And as soon as that uh, primary, as soon as the uh, primary cluster comes back up, uh, the footage is recorded back there. So it doesn't really have to replicate or transfer data between the two. The system's just intelligent enough to know, all right, if I'm looking for this particular period in time, I need to go to this particular uh, uh, virtual server. So the software, uh, the vendor software that, that we use as a visual on actually um, is intelligent enough to know where to pick the data from, uh, whether it be the primary site or the secondary site. So, got it. Howard, let me add something to that. Go ahead, please, Mohi. Sure. So, I, you know, I don't know if it's meant to be done like this, but we, um, back to your VDI solution. So, we realized that on the same cluster, we could actually run the Surface role also, Scalar File Server. So, though we're running a hyperconverged environment, but we said if we are for any reason, the processing gets intensive because we, you know, we had some client that said we want to run VDI environment and we didn't want to bog down our primary four clusters or node here. So we actually set up a second cluster node and use this as a completely Surface role as a share. So since the caching was working so nice, we said, why not? Why don't we use this as a hard drive for a second cluster and see how that works? Yeah, I know they're all just kind of thinking how we're doing it. So it's, yeah, it's just a, so it's, you've got a four node cluster, but acting as a Surface role only, and then a cluster on top of it using as a hard drive. And actually it worked beautifully. So we just realized that not only can we use a Apple conversion environment for hosting 150, 160 VMs. Uh, we could actually throw any other servers uh, in front of it as just a cluster and use it as a scale out file server at the same machines. And there was no problem with that. It you know worked wonderfully. So that was uh, also another. And I was telling you when we were doing it, I think we need to talk about data on too. So I love how Jason and Steven, you know, because I will trouble them on weekends and I get the emails back on weekends. So it's not an issue of saying we're trying this without telling them what we're doing, but they will jump in and help. So you guys have been amazing that way too. I just wanted to kind of put that plug in for you guys because you have really helped me in so many times. So appreciate that. Yeah, trust me, I, I do know all that email comes through. I'm just not responding, but I do know your emails. Um, hey, Russ, from your perspective, um, what are some of the uh, uh, good things you've seen with Microsoft that you feel that it, it, it's a it's the right direction for you guys as an uh, organization. So I think that when it's running well, it's a really good solution, and we never have clients complain about it being too fast. I know that. I think that the hardware that lies underneath the solution is, for me, really important, and the support we get from data on is is invaluable. Uh, I haven't experienced that with any other solution we've deployed, to be honest with you. Hardware seems very solid. I only I have a couple things I'll talk about with the the actual uh, the nodes. Is one, the SSDs can be really hard to get out of that tray to figure out the serial number on it. And two, it seems like whenever you're around the front of those things and interacting with them, you always tend to unlatch some of the drive bays, and that always kind of wigs me out. Beyond that, I think that the gear itself has been really bulletproof for us. And I've actually done some of the things I heard you guys talking about, where we'll run like a two node cluster that hosts VMs and a file server role, right? And it, it works. You use them in different fashions. 
and we do video too. We actually have a couple of really deep video repositories that our ONSSI software writes to, and that was the same way. Um, we got rid of uh, appliances. They basically were super micro uh, appliances and replaced them with data on, and everybody who interacts with the video system says it's much better than it was. So. I agree. I mean, it, it, sometimes it's hard to quantify exactly how well something is performing, but when we took our hundreds of VMs off of our legacy solution and placed them into HCI, a whole bunch of anomalous issues went away that we never could have trouble shot because it simply had to do with the performance underlying the VMs. Got it. Yeah, this, uh, hey guys, this has been incredibly awesome. Um, yeah, I think for me is is just continue to share, and there's a lot of form out there uh, to to share information. Uh, you know, we we are in a software defined world. There's a lot of experts out there, uh, and, and and please don't reach out every time you need help. You know, everybody here on this call are actually really good at Azure Stack ACI. They all you know they become very good for whatever reason because they have to be, and. And I think for us to just continue to share these challenges we face and, and make sure we can help each other. Um, Darrow and John, Marlon, any last words? Yes. Two weeks. Two weeks, MS inspired. <laughs> <laughs> So, so John, is there any anything, any session that we need to follow or is it just what's the keynote or do you know? Uh, don't know yet. To be honest with you. Okay. 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 Yeah. So I, I wanted to say, so everyone in the call, when I, when I'm at a customer and I've done the implementation, a lot of customers are unaware of the hybrid cloud features that Microsoft's offering, right? And there's a bunch of cool stuff in there, like Azure Site Recovery, uh, Azure Backup Connection to DPM, Azure File Sync. Uh, so I really encourage you all to check those out. They're really easy to implement and can help a lot in a, in a lot of cases and save you some costs actually. So that's are my last famous words. Okay. Hey guys, uh, thanks for joining the uh, customer roundtable. I appreciate it. Uh, I can do this every day. We'll at least try to do once a month to, to say hi to you guys. Stay safe, stay healthy, please. And I hope to see you guys face to face very soon. Trust me, I, I want to visit all of you one by one. Okay. Have a great time. Stay home. Talk to you guys soon. Okay, I can't expire. Howard. Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Microsoft inspired. Yeah. Please go. I can virtually. <laughs> Thank thanks. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.